Hi guys, this is Rohit here and today we are going to take it right from where we left in the last session. So last session was about descriptive statistics and this session is called inferential statistics. So today is inferential statistics part one. So inferential statistics is basically divided into two parts, right? So today we are going to cover the first part and then in the next session we are going to cover the second part. And this is just directly after what you have studied. So basically there's everything is in just continuity with the descriptive stats section. So with inferential stats, what are we going to do? So descriptive stats was where we talked about mean, median, mode and all of those measures and basically how they're useful and when they're useful. We talked about standard deviations. So those are descriptive stats, right? Because, because they kind of help us describe the data that we have at hand. So that's awesome. That's perfectly fine. We understood all of that. So why inferential stats? Inferential stat is, uh, well, we want to kind of not only describe the data, but we want to infer from the data, right? So that's why inferential stats. So descriptive stats was basically we could describe our data. Hey, look, this is how our data looks like. This is how the data is distributed. Uh, this is a mean, this is a standard deviation. This is how the variation in the data is. Inferential stats goes beyond the step and it says that, hey, I think this is my data. Now let me try and infer uh, what is probably the price in this particular neighborhood, right? right? Because we are talking about prices of houses in New York. So now if I want to infer prices in a particular neighborhood or if I want to infer probably, you know, if I take 15 samples out of this population, out of this entire uh, Brooklyn house and sorry, out of this entire New York City, I take 15, 20 houses and I'm going to just based on those 15, 20 houses, if I want to infer the entire uh, prices about the entire New York City, right? So if I want to do all of those kind of things, when I'm trying to just take a small sample of the data, because at the end of the day, understand this, right? Because we are uh, talking about this problem where we are uh, trying to estimate prices in New York City, right? So that was John's major problem, right? When John started, he basically had to figure out how to allocate his funds. Now, to do that, he has to, the, the obviously the most essential way you can, most basic thing you can do is basically go and collect every house data possible in New York City. Like every house possible, right? At every, every, uh, whatever, 50, 60,000, one lakh, two lakh, I don't know what is the amount, but you have to collect the data from all the houses. And based on those houses, you can draw your inferences, right? About what is the kind of fund that you would want to allocate. Now, the second option is basically, uh, yeah, John doesn't really have that much time. So he probably, what he'll do is, he'll probably take a sample of 15, 20 houses. And from those 15, 20 houses, he will try and infer something which is generalizable about the entire houses of New York, right? So he would kind of select those 15, 20 houses strategically. And then he's going to do some strategic inference on that. And based on those inferences, he's going to conclude something about the entire houses in New York, right? So that is what is called, that is the whole concept about inferential statistics. Now, inferential statistics is a big, 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 uh, I would say it's a very long course in a normal university curriculum, right? So it's actually a semester long course that is there in inferential stats, uh, specifically everything that we're going to cover here, right? So starting from descriptive stats to all the way inferential stats. Everything is uh, in a real university course is a semester long course. So now that we are trying to cover all of that in a very short and uh, concise way in probably two, three hours, uh, what that kind of does is two things. One is obviously it makes it uh, very brief and concise for you to consume very easily, right? But at the same time, there's a slight, slight problem with all of this concising, right? Which is that uh, there would be parts which would seem like, uh, hey, this, uh, this is probably moving a bit too fast or this is probably moving a bit too slow. So I'll do at my end is basically to try and go as slow as possible on each of the topics so that you kind of get the links. Uh, but obviously there would be certain things which are probably not clear in the first run. So this probably, this particular lecture is something that you would probably want to kind of view at a probably a slower speed or probably view multiple times or stop and then look up things on Google, understand a bit more and then look back. So that that's something that you might want to do in this particular lecture. So that's a heads up. Uh, apart from that, yeah, this is, uh, this is probably one of the more tougher, I would not say tough, but probably one of the more complex parts of uh, your entire curriculum. Everything up from here, right? After inferential stats is gonna be absolutely easy. So just hold on with me with this one. You understand this, it's gonna help you for your lifetime, right? And this is something that is very, very critical for you to understand. 
uh, and obviously if you have some kind of statistics or a maths or engineering kind of a background you probably know half of this already uh, or probably fully entire thing already but if you do not know don't get afraid if you do not uh, you're not from maths background and that's perfectly fine we are going to talk we are going to try and talk about very simple examples such that every one of us can understand and relate to uh, given that's the context now let's get started with inferential statistics so program so far obviously you have been introduced to python that's uh, awesome if you are not still introduced to python or you are not familiar with it hmm, not probably right time to kind of go ahead and jump into inferential statistics i would suggest go back get that done really really very well before you kind of uh, before you kind of you know uh, go ahead and try and jump into this piece uh, you can do street fighting with python yeah you can do i'm guessing all of that is part of it and you also know what are the machine learning processes and various stages in it from a 30,000 feet perspective, right? So, yeah, you have that overall idea of where machine learning is all about, what is it all about, what differentiates machine learning from rule-based systems and all of that thing. So, that, that's a fairly good place to be in. Also, you know about what you what is not written here is you also know about descriptive stats. So, you understand what is mean, median, mode what is standard deviation, interquartile range, all of that, right? So that's awesome. So now agenda for the day is first we get introduced to this concept of probability. Then we understand this concept of sample population, then some random terms. So I want PMF, PDF and CDF. And then we talk about two probability distributions, binomial and normal. So first up is introduction to probability. So John is still searching. So what does so well buying a house is obviously no joke. Uh, there are a number of factors that need to be considered when selecting a one particular house. Obviously, right? One such factor is neighborhood. Yesterday we learned that Brooklyn is one of the five boroughs in New York. So New York is basically split into five different regions per se. So Brooklyn is uh, one of them, and then there is uh, Manhattan. There are a couple of them. I forgot the names. Manhattan is basically the one which is the most expensive place in New York. Uh, but it has, uh, yeah, so it has basically those the several neighborhoods, right? So neighborhoods are basically the small sub-regions within uh, boroughs. And interestingly, like in any big city, some are rich, some are poor, some are in the process of being gentrified, some are actually culturally diverse. So yeah, there are a lot of variations in the different neighborhoods, right? So that, that's, a, no, no, that's a message from that particular point. And John has displayed interest in several such neighborhoods and in addition to his 1460 observation, you remember this 1460 observations from previous session, right? So John was looking through New York prices and he found this 1460 population, right? 1460 houses that he had and we found out the mean of those, we found the median of those. You remember that deal, right? So we had looked at this 1460 houses and their corresponding prices. And he found out the neighborhood of each and every one of them. Fair enough, this is what we have done. So this is one of the neighborhoods, right? So I don't know what is this called, but this is something that we can see from the map is adjacent to the sea. So now John is curious. So by just looking at the data, John sees this interesting house prices in a neighborhood called Old Town. So he's curious about this neighborhood and wants to see for his own amusement that if one was to pick a house at random, what were the chances that the house would be in Old Town, right? So again so john is now curious about this different neighborhoods that he can find right john is curious about finding a house and he comes across this particular neighborhood and he sees that there's one particular neighborhood called old town so now he's curious that what is the what are the chances that he might end up in this particular neighborhood right so this whole thing that the word basic word that i just used right now so what is the chance that you would end up in that particular local neighborhood right so this word chance is the precursor to the everything, every concept in probability, right? So now let's introduce ourselves to the first, to the concepts of probability, right? So there are two basic approaches in considering probability. So the first one is frequentist approach. So it is defined by the frequency of the event based on the data. Uh, Sounds obvious, right? You would obviously define your frequency based on frequency of data. I, you know, this doesn't sound. Let's let's understand that in a real world example. And there's a Bayesian approach, which is defined by combining previous experience about the event and the current data. So going forward in the day, we would be discussing mostly about the frequentist approach. 
that's perfectly fine but let's understand what is frequentist and bayesian right sounds very sounds very hodgepodge out there right so let's look at the example assume a situation where you have lost your phone right so now how would you kind of try and figure that lost phone so there are two options for you one is you would try and give a call on that phone right and based on where the sound of that come bringing phone is coming from you would try and guess that right so that is a frequent test approach right based on you give it a call and you try and see hey the sound is coming from this uh, probably there is a chance that this sound is coming from sofa this is chance there is a chance it's coming from the bedroom so the chance for coming from sofa is 30% if it's probably 50% chance that it's coming from bedroom and 20% chance it's coming from the kitchen based on the sound and how you hear it so you can kind of give probabilities to the different locations that's one way you can figure out where your phone is now the other option is you are like hey i think i remember what happened last time last time i had kept it in the fridge for some reason you had kept it in the fridge and you remember hey there was fridge and the time before that i had lost it in uh the kitchen itself right somewhere in the cupboards so now you know that probably yes given those two information i can definitely say that this is also the third time that i would also lose it somewhere in the kitchen probably for sure right and you probably give it a 90% probability given your last experience so that is a bayesian approach so you have knowledge about what you did last time and based on that understanding you can basically uh, predict that probably this time also it would be on kitchen that's your bayesian approach the frequentist approach was you kind of give a call and based on whether the intensity of the sound and all of that you kind of give probabilities to each other so there's no no previous knowledge that is involved right so that is the basic concept of frequentist and bayesian and as we say uh in this particular lecture we are going to concern mostly about frequentist approach we are going to touch small basics of bayesian but that's about it we are not going to go into details of bayesian approach at all we are just going to stick to frequentist so now basic basic intuition of probabilities right so let's start with let's say we start with a simple example right so the first example is that of a flipping of a coin right so flipping of a coin and intuitively there is a 50% chance that you would get a head and there is a 50% chance that you would get a tail now this is because there are only two possible outcomes right so therefore we say that the probability of head there's a head that would come up in the toss of a coin is 0.5 probability that there would be a tail that would come up is 0.5 and probability can roughly be described as the percentage chance of an event or a sequence can occurring right so you would top coin you would flip a coin and there's a 50% chance that it would basically be head and 50% because it could be a tail right so this is very simple right if you kind of understand this right you toss a coin it could only be two of out only two outcomes there right so it could be a head and it could be a tail and there's no bias against head or a tail right had been a loaded coin right the like the coin which probably there's probably a lot of mass on the head side a lot of mass on the tail side then you would probably toss it and then there's a lot of higher chance that it would land up on the head side or the tail side if it was a biased coin right so those ones that you see in some movies right so if you have that you would probably have a large ball you would probably have a higher probability of head or a higher probability of tail but in a normal unbiased coin which is basically the normal day to day coin you flip it it could be anything right it could be head or tail so 50% chance of each of them right so that's why 50% chance so that's why we say probability of head being 0.5 or probability of tail also being 0.5 right so basic some basic terminology that we kind of need to clear up first is experiment experiment is basically this whole concept that of coin tossing right so flipping a coin right so how that is that thing that is what we call as an experiment so this coin tossing event is basically an experiment the, where basically these are uncertain situations which could have multiple outcomes right it could be a head or a tail so this whole experiment thing is coin tossing right you want to do 10 experiments mean you want to probably do 10 times you would probably want to flip your coin next is outcome what is outcome outcome is basically the result of a single trial okay so basically one experiment or one trial whatever we call it the result of that is basically uh, your outcome right so basically the first experiment you would have head or a tail now what if you have head that is your outcome in the next experiment you again toss it and it's again a head and that's your outcome right so that's the second outcome uh, event is basically one or more outcomes from an experiment so 
and what is event event is basically the possible outcomes right so there's a there could be head there could be tail so those are two events that could happen for a single trial right so a uh, coin toss as i said is an experiment outcome is basically the result of a single trial and then event is basically the possibilities right so head is one possible outcome tails is also one possible outcome now each of them so at the end of the day when you do an experiment you would have one outcome right but there could be two events associated with it and each of those events would basically have some probability associated with it right so events are associated with probabilities but at the end of the day when you observe what you observe is just an outcome right so it could be head or it could be tail it would not it would definitely not be 50% head and 50% tail right it would be either be a head or be a tail but both of those events have a 50% probability right so probabilities are basically before you observe the outcome right so once you observe the outcome it could be basically either a head or a tail right so that's perfectly awesome so now there are some basic rules that are associated with probability at least uh, you know these are universally common across whatever probability you're dealing with you're doing with frequentist or bayesian doesn't matter so there are least there's some comprehensive rules so the first is probability of an event would basically lie between zero zero is basically that nothing is occurring right so probability basically if an event being zero means that it's definitely definitely not going to happen right so probably i don't know probability of i don't know uh some event right any event india probably playing fifa world cup in 2018 right so that that is something that you know had already happened even if you want to predict it for future probably you would say zero right because it's probably close to zero uh and one is certainly occurs right so probability of india playing cricket world cup for example would be one right because you know that it's going to play right so almost nearly one and probability of india playing fifa world cup is almost zero so you can say that the probability of any event right any event basically any any coin toss be it coin toss be india playing anything be it uh finding a house within this particular range any probability should lie between zero and one right so uh that that's fairly understandable right zero is basically where it's surely not going to happen one is where it's surely going to happen right and it could be anything between that right so the next concern is next thing to understand is this particular notation called a bar right so a bar a dash whatever you call it so for any event a a dash is called as a complementary event right so which basically means that if pro a is basically signifying the event a would happen a dash basically implies the a event a would not happen right so basically if my event a is india playing world cup uh fifa world cup and probability of that is zero a dash is basically the event that india would not be playing fifa world cup right so a was the event india would be playing and a dash is the event india would not be playing right so that that's a, that's fairly easy to understand and obviously you can understand if probability of a is x then probability of a dash is 1 minus x right so it just the opposite of it so that's why it's called a complementary event right so a happens the probability of it is x a dash the probability of the same is 1 minus x so now for this example let's say if a is the event that number 3 will appear on your when you roll a die right so then a dash would be the event that 3 does not appear right so which basically means that it could be any of 1 2 4 5 or 6 right so in this case probability of a is 1 by 6 now why is 1 by 6 so probability of a probability of a is so we want there are there's one possible outcome which is 3 and there are six possible outcomes right 1 2 3 4 5 6 so because of that the probability of event a is 1 by 6 now probability of a dash is a would it would not be 3 right so it could be anything else but it's not 3 so in that case our possible options are 1 2 4 5 and 6 and out of possible options 1 2 3 4 5 6 so there are five possible options out of six total possible options right so we 
five favorable outcomes out of total six possible options right in this case there was one favorable outcome the outcome that we want to measure the probability of and there are six total possible outcomes so that's why the probability of a is 1 by 6 and probability of a dash is 5 by 6 and you can see that this is equal to 1 minus 1 by 6 fair enough so now some more uh, basic uh, basic rules about probability so the basic terminologies i would say so the next terminology is mutually exclusive events so what are mutually exclusive events mutually exclusive events are basically those events uh, that cannot happen together right so for example uh, it is impossible to roll a five and a three on a single die at the same time right so if you want if your event is basically that it would be a five when you roll a die or it would be three when you roll a die uh, both the events are basically mutually exclusive right if it's five it cannot be three if it's three it cannot be five for that matter any of it uh, if you roll a die any of the events right if it's one two three four five or six any of those six events are mutually exclusive right if one of them happens the rest of them cannot happen right it can be only one outcome right similarly with a coin toss also heads and tails right it, heads and tails are mutually exclusive event if head if in a particular outcome if in a particular coin flip there's a head then obviously there cannot be a tail right so this is a concept of mutually exclusive events right events which are exclusive right so only one of them can happen if a and b are two events then probability of at least one of them occurring can be represented as p of a union b right so now uh, what are what could be this events a and b for example uh, anything right so for example what would be uh, india playing FIFA World Cup and India playing Cricket World Cup, right? So those are two different events and then the probability of at least one of them occurring is given by probability of A intersection A union B, right? So let's get familiar with this terminology as well. So this particular sign U, right? So this is basically representative of union, right? And then this is something that is probably we'll talk about it later, which is the sign of intersection. We'll probably talk about that in the later slide. So understand this that A union, this is this basically sees uh, this basically notation is of A union B. So if A and B are two events of two different events, then the probability of at least one of them occurring is given by probability of A intersection A union B, right? And the probability of at least one or two of mutually exclusive events is the sum of their respective probabilities, right? So if A and B are two mutually exclusive events, then the probability of at least one of them occurring can be written than P of A union B equals to P of A plus P of B, right? So what is what what is what is that we are saying? That if A and B are two events which cannot happen together, then the probability of at least one of them happening is probability of first event plus probability of second event. For example, the same example right a and b be the event that we get the number three and five respectively when a die is rolled now the probability that we will get either three or five is basically the summation of their individual probabilities right so if i so and it's very clear to understand why is this the case so we are basically concerned about a intersection b right so a intersection b is basically three or five so there are two possible outcomes three or five any of them would be fine with me and out of six possible outcomes right so that is two out of six so which is also equals to one by six plus one by six right so this is for probability a equals to three probability b equals to five right so probability of a in union b is basically probability of a plus probability of b right so this is pa plus pb these are the two events right and we can see that this is something that holds right because these two events are mutually exclusive right mutually exclusive just that means that there's a probability of zero so probability of so this is how you would say this equals to zero for mutually exclusive events a intersection basically means that three and five both of them will occur right so that is zero right because it's a single die roll in a die roll there can be only one outcome 
so the outcome that it is both 3 and 5 that is 0 right because there cannot be two outcomes there can only be one outcome hence it is 0 so that is why you would say p of a intersection b equals to 0 for mutually exclusive events right so this is a union b right so which is 3 or 5 and this is a intersection b this is opposite of union right so just remember this symbol as well so this is opposite of union so union is just like u and this is inverted u so a intersection b is 0 because what you are saying by intersection b is that there's 3 and 5 right so this is 3 or 5 this is 3 and 5 and obviously 3 or 5 you can have right you can proceed to have either 3 or 5 but you cannot have 3 and 5 in the single die roll right so that's why it's 0 right so in case of a mutually exclusive event you can basically say a or b is pro nothing but a plus b right which is awesome we understand this pretty clearly now so now what happens in non mutual exclusive events right so to understand what happens in case of non mutual exclusive events let's draw a diagram to understand that so this is my probability a and this is my b right so this is my event a this is my event b and my probability of a union b this is my probability of a union b right so probability of a union b is basically given by probability of a this is the entire circle right so now let me draw this circle so this is probability of a so probability of a plus probability of b right But what is wrong with this because if we are doing so the probability of a union b is basically this entire area right so now if we are doing probability of a plus probability of b this is region this is the region that is we are counting it twice over right so we are counting it here as well and we are counting it this here as well right so it's part of a as well it's part of b as well now if the entire area is a inter a union b we are basically concerned with the entire area right so if we do PA plus PB, we are basically over counting this particular area twice. So that's why we, we need to subtract this area from and this area is nothing but A intersection B, right? So this is basically the common area between A and B and that's why it's P of A union B is basically P of A which is this entire circle plus P of B which is this entire circle minus this common area because you have counted this twice over, right? You have counted this in A as well as part of B. So now you want to remove that. So that is why you want to remove this. Now you can clearly see that for mutually exclusive events, P of A intersection B is zero, right? So for mutually exclusive events, it's basically like this, right? So this is your B and this is your A. So this is A, this is B, this is A, this is B. So in case of mutually exclusive, you can see that probability of a intersection b is nothing but probability of a plus probability of b and that's it because there's nothing a probability of a intersection b is zero so there's no common area between them so that's pretty clear awesome we kind of understand this whole thing together uh, so now let's do this class activity which is in case of 50 students let's say 30 students play hockey and 25 students play cricket and 15 students play both hockey and cricket so what is the probability that a randomly selected student from the class plays either hockey or cricket but not both right so we are concerned about what is the probability that someone plays either hockey or cricket but not both right so now let's look at this so probability of a is basically 30 out of 50 a is basically the event that a student plays hockey and b be the event where student plays cricket so probability of A is 30 out of 50, probability of B is 25 out of 50. So prob and probability of A intersection B, which is both cricket and hockey, right? So there's 15 out of 30, 15 out of 50. So therefore the probability that a randomly selected student plays either hockey or cricket is 30 by 50 plus 25 by 50 minus 15 by 40. So that comes out to be roughly around 40 by 50. So that is four by five. So there's a 80% probability that a student plays either hockey or cricket right which is awesome right because you can already see out of 30 you know there's a lot of people actually play either cricket or hockey or combine both of them right so obviously 
probability that a randomly selected student plays either hockey or cricket is probability of A intersection B which is either hockey or cricket and that is probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection B. Awesome, so we understand this concept of uh, of A intersection A union B. So now let's consider this example. So specialized university offers four different graduate courses, business, education, accounting and science. So enrollment figures shows 25 of the graduate students are, e are in each specialty. That's awesome. All the 50 of the students are female and only 15 are female business majors. If a student is randomly selected from the university's registration database, what is the probability that a student is a business or an education major? So what is the probability that a student would be a business or an education major, right? So now we know what is the number of students who are enrolled in business as well as education. So there are 25 students who are enrolled in business and there are 25 students who are enrolled in education major, right? So what is the probability that a student is business or education? So we are basically looking at 50 possible favorable outcomes, right? So there are 100 possible students, 25 in each of the four categories. And out of those, we are concerned with 50 possible favorable outcomes, right? So 50 out of 100, which is basically 0.25 plus 0.25, right? Which is also the same thing, right? Business, if there's someone is doing a major in business, obviously he cannot do a major as well as in education, right? So 25 students are in different groups of business and education. So probability of business plus probability of education equals to 0.25 plus 0.25 equals to 0.5. And probability that a student is a female or a business major is not mutually exclusive, right? Because there could be someone who is a female as well as a business major, major, right? Which was not the case earlier, right? Because earlier it was either you could be a business major or an education major. But now if you're a female, you could also be a business major, right? So those are not mutually exclusive events. So now what is the probability that someone would be female or a business major is a probability of female plus probability of business major minus the probability of a, being a both a female as well as a business major. So that you can see is 0.5 because there are 50% there are total 50 females out of 100 uh, students. After that the probability of business which is same 0.25 because there are 25 students in each of the majors. So 25 students minus probability of female intersection business right so probability of people who are both female as well as business major right so that is 15 out of 100 so 0.15 so that comes out to be probability that a student could be a female or a business major is 0 0.60 so now some basic concepts uh, again some uh, as of now we have understood the concept of mutually exclusive events and probability union a union b a intersection b that's all fine so now there's a slightly new concept which we have talked about is called the uh, joint probability right so which is basically this concept of intersection right so that's perfectly fine so the concept that we're going to talk about is called independent events what are independent events events which basically can happen so now we are going to talk about an interesting concept which is after what we have learned so we have learned as of now mutually exclusive events and a, a union b a intersection b so now the new concept is called independence of events so as of now we have understood what it means for events to be mutually exclusive so now we are talking about something called independent events so what are independent events independent events are basically those events the where the occurrence of one event does not affect the other event right so and they could happen together right so that's perfectly fine they can happen together this is these are not mutually exclusive events mutually exclusive events are those events which cannot happen together right so it cannot be three or a five right but mutually uh, these are independent event this just says that they can happen together definitely but it's just that the occurrence of one does not affect each other right so that's perfectly fine right so for example if you roll two dice right if you roll one two dice and what is the probability that it would be three on and five on the other right so what is the probability now three can happen these are two independent events right so three could happen in one die five could happen in the other die and they are not affected by each other right so your role of it, it's not like your one die is kind of dependent on the result of the other die so if though that is the case then probability that there is three in one die and five in one die can probably is just a product of the individual probabilities of three in one die and the five in one die which is basically one sixth and one sixth 
so now let's consider this event suppose we are drawing one card from a deck of 52 cards right so in case of uh, okay before we go there the concept behind independent events are i kind of want to write that down because yeah so independent events are basically those events which are where occurrence of one is not dependent on the other right so a and b can happen together in case of mutually exclusive events this is zero right which is basically they cannot even occur together in case of independent events probability of a intersection b exists and that is basically probability of a into probability of b right so these are two events which are not dependent on each other right but they can definitely happen together right so the same example as i gave you it could roll two die and there could be the a event a is basically is three in one die and there's five in one die that could definitely happen right three in one die five in second die so there are two different dies and it could definitely be possible there's three in one day and there's five in one day. Now what is the possibility of that particular event happening? So that is probability of A which is one sixth. Probability of three coming up in one day is one sixth, right? There are six possible options and three is just one of them. And probability of five is also one sixth. So probability of three in one day and five in the second day is basically one by 36. So that's the concept. So now if you apply the same logic out here so suppose we are drawing one card from a deck of 52 cards now let a be the event that we get a card numbered six and b be the event that we get a card colored red right so we are basically talking about uh, the red so when we are talking about probability of a intersection b we are basically talking about the card number which is six as well as red right so what is the what is the probability of that particular thing happening this is 1 by 26, right? So there are only two cards in red color 6, right? So which is a red of hearts and red of uh, brick, right? So red of heart and red of brick. So those are only two possible options. And you can see that that's exactly what is happening. So 2 out of 52 is 1 by 26. And you can see the same logic applied here as well. So probability of A intersection B, right? So A is the event that is a card number 6. So how many possible options are there? So there are four possible options of card being numbered six, right? So six of each of the uh, spade, brick, and all of the possible options, right? So there are four possible options that the card could be number six out of 52 options. And the probability of B is basically B is this event where it could be colored red, right? So there are 26 colors, right? So there are four colors, uh, there are, sorry, 26 colors, uh, that are colored red right so there are two of each of heart as well as brick so 13 each of red, red 13 each of brick and 13 each of hearts right so there are 26 cards that could be colored red so 26 out of 52 so your 4 by 52 into 26 by 52 it comes out to be 1 by 26 so that's fairly understandable right so this concept of independence of events right so in also in this case you can see that the events a and b are independent right so that we get a colored now card number six is completely independent from the event that we get a card colored red right so they are not they are not dependent in any which way you can get a colored number six i can get a card red as well there's nothing which particularly joins them so now coming back to our friend john so now john wants to check the probability of picking a house in old town so this is nothing but number of houses in old town by total number of houses so like let's now go through the same thing in python so we import the library so now what we do is basically the same thing so first we figure out what are the total number of houses in old town versus total number of houses that he's looking at so he's looking at somewhere around 1460 houses and With that, we basically see that his probability of picking a house in Old Town is 0 0.07, right? So roughly 7% of all the houses are in Old Town, which is fine, which is something we take it as, a, as it is. There's nothing we can talk about it. So that's obviously at random the probability of choosing a house. Uh, what does that 0 0.07 probability basically means? It just that says that out of all possible options of choosing a house, if we randomly choose one, 
there's a seven percent chance that it would basically be an old town right so now what if john was extra curious so having found out the probability of picking a house from old town neighborhood what if john wanted to go further so let's see what john wants to do now so even though this would be pretty redundant but when picking one by one what would be the again probability of first picking a house from old town so now john is kind of doing something slightly advanced than what he was told to do so earlier he was just picking one house and he was saying that yeah probability of it belonging to old town is seven percent which is awesome now he's saying okay i get that i when i pick it the first time i get a seven percent now that i've picked already one house from old town or whatever locality i've picked one house now what is the probability that the second time i pick another house what is the probability of that belonging to old town will that be still the same as my first probability will it change that's a question that we need to understand right so if i'm picking one by one uh, houses up from this data set so first time i get it first time if my probability of choose getting a house from old town is seven percent but now that i've chosen it and it's gone what is the probability whether will the probability still be the same so now this is the concept of conditional probability and this probably might sound uh, complicated but let's break it down starting with an easy example that's always the best way to do simple examples to get complicated concepts so now let's say there are there's a bag and we are eating m&ms m&ms i don't know if you're familiar with chocolates right basically that's it so there are 10 chocolates in the bag five are green five are blue right so what is the probability of getting three blue can three blue candies in a row right so probability of getting the first blue is easy right so it's five out of ten so there are five green five blue so probability of getting blue in the first attempt is five out of ten which is fine when we pick the next blue candy though we have removed this first candy so now there are only four blue options available right out of nine possible candies right because we have removed one so now the so let's draw this out and understand this clearly so now let's understand this with a clear example right so let's say these are the m and so so there are five blues plus five greens right so now obviously when i'm choosing uh, what i'm trying to concern i'm concerned about the event a where there are three blues picked in random sorry three blues picked consecutively what is the probability of this particular event happening right so in the if we want a blue in the first place right if we want a blue in the first place then the probability is very simple it's five out of ten now once we have taken that blue right assuming this is a set now we want the second blue now in this we want consecutive blue that means the first one is blue so for that the probability is five by ten obviously if the first one is blue then we are remaining with four blues plus five greens right so there are nine possible options and out of those nine we want to choose four right there are four possible blues that we can and in the next iteration we will basically be left with three blues plus five greens in that case if the first two are blue then obviously from this configuration if we have again have to choose a blue the probability is three by eight right so and these as you can see are independent events right so the probability of this particular event happening is five by ten into four by nine into three by eight right so that's the that's the understanding that we need to develop right so that's pretty clear right from this example it's not very tough to understand this concept now let's see what kind of thing that we are talking when we say conditional probability what is the thing that we are trying to say so obviously since we are calculating the probability of picking one blue candy and one blue candy and one blue candy our final probability is as, as we said right so 5 by 10 into 4 by 9 into 3 by 8 which comes out to be 8.3 so there's a 8.3 percent chance that we, we we pick randomly three candies one after the other out of them this three of them would be consecutively be blue there's a 8.3 percent chance right that's clearly understood right so if you pick three ran candies randomly from this jar of 10 candies the probability that all three of them would be consecutively be blue is 8.3 percent so okay simple tricks uh, i think we have talked about this already also which is basically whenever we have to verbally say and like we did above we just want to multiply the properties right and is basically the concept of a intersection b right 
and a intersection b if they are independent events they can be multiplied so that's that's something that you need to remember whenever you are saying and we have talked about this earlier as so a pre a intersection b is what we are meaning when we are saying and and when we are saying a union b this is all right so a union b is a or b a intersection b is a and b right and obviously if it's a intersection b it can be written as p a into p b if they are independent events and this is equals to p a plus p b if they are mutually exclusive events right so that's a simple trick uh, obviously remember this thing that this is a trick and this is not a heuristic this is not a rule right obviously you understand when these conditions are valid right so in this case if a and b are basically a and b right so that means intersection so then you add them prob then you multiply the probabilities only if they are independent events right similarly if it's a union b a or b then you add those probabilities but under the condition that they are mutually exclusive if they are not mutually exclusive you have to add a term minus p of a intersection b right so that's a that's a fundamental understanding that you have to keep in mind so this is a simple heuristics that whenever it talks about and just multiply them whenever it talks about or just add them but keep that in mind right you are, this is this doesn't apply absolutely universally so what is the probability of picking a green candy or a blue candy and consider we have seven candies so let's do both of the cases the first problem is what is the probability of picking a green candy or a blue candy so probability of picking a blue candy or green candy is mutually exclusive right so if you are taking blue candy and a green candy it cannot be possible that you would basically have both of them so obviously the answer is 5 by 10 5 by 10 right so in, that's perfectly fine it's blue or green right and you can basically take one right which is basically obviously if i take anything out of those 10 things right out of those 10 candies that has to be either blue or green right so obviously that has the probability of that being obviously is one right so probability that any can random any random candy that we select out of that jar would be blue or green is one right because obviously there are only two possible colors so obviously it has to be one right so that's obvious right so and that you can verify from here as well right and the same thing that you can do out here is uh, the next question was what is the probability consider that we have 7 green candies and 5 blue candies what is the probability so there are 12 candies all in all and out of those 12 candies what is the probability of picking one by one and without replacing 2 green candies or 2 blue candies right so 2 consecutive green candies or 2 consecutive blue candies if we randomly choose 2 of them so then that's something that we know so first we calculate two green candies candies what is their independent event so we know the probabilities of both of them so that is 7 by 12 into 6 by 11 right and two blue candies would be 5 by 12 into 4 by 11 and these are or so basically these are mutually exclusive events and right? it could be two either it could be two green two blue right so there's no way it can match it so that's perfectly fine so we basically just directly add them and we get that this 62 by 132 so that's perfectly awesome we understand uh, we do understand we do understand this concept of what is the probability of selecting one after the other right so now you know that if john were to go and select one house from old neighborhood what a old town neighborhood the probability of him selecting the next house also from old neighborhood would not exactly be the same because he has already chosen one house out of that set right so that's that's a concept that you need to kind of keep in mind so now we need to talk about this idea of conditional probability as such so conditional probability is now say i roll a fair die and let a be the event of outcome that it's an odd number right so a could be out of the six possible outcomes there are only three of them which we are favorable one three or five and let also b be the event that the outcome is less than or equal to three so possible options for b are 1 2 3 now what is the probability of a uh, p a one what is the probability of a given p right so that is so again some notation that you see here a and there's a pipe and then there's b right so what this means is probability of a given b right so let's kind of understand that notation as well while we are talking about it so probability of event a so what is the probability of event a there are three possible options 
out of that six possible total options right so three favorable options out of six possible options we are fine with any three of these options uh, and there are six possible options so probability of event a is one by two right now what is the probability of event a given b right so in our experiment we know that if event b has already occurred so a given b basically means that what is the probability of a if i have told you that b has already occurred right so that is a way to interpret that whole thing right p a pi b that is basically means what is the probability of event a given b has happened right so if i tell you that b has already happened so that means that the sum is basically less than 3 right uh, so then the outcome must be 1 of 1 2 3 right so b has happened means the outcome is 1 of 1 2 3 so for event a which is basically now out of event a was basically it could be any of the odd outcomes right so now what is the probability of a if i told you that b has already occurred which is simple right so the a intersection b right so there could be only be 1 and 3 right so there are three possible outcomes given b has already happened and now what is the probability of a which is that it would be an odd number right so that is only one and three out of one two three those are the only two possible outcomes that we are likely to which would basically is the probability of event a right so probability of a given b is probability of a intersection b by probability of b now probability of a intersection b is there are two possible outcomes and probability of b is basically the three possible outcomes so two out of three is our probability of a given b right so and that is fairly simple right so if i tell you that b is, has happened and b basically just consists of three possible outcomes so one two three out of them if i what is the probability of a a is that the, the outcome is an odd number so out of one two three one and three are basically the favorable outcomes so that makes it probability of a given b as two by three right so so that's the concept of conditional probability so conditional probability is something that we are also we have already talked about this so this is probability of a intersection b and we have we are very familiar with this diagram by now we have already drawn this in earlier so this is a this entire blue circle is entire a, blue circle is a entire green circle is b and the area between them is a intersection b so probability of a given b is probability of a intersection b by probability of b right so you are basically concerned about that if I have told you that B is already happened, then what is the probability of A happening? Which is simple, right? So this is the probability of A intersection B by probability of the entire B, right? So that's perfectly fine. We understand conditional probability as well. So now what would be the probability of first picking a house from Old Town neighborhood and then again picking a house from the same neighborhood? So now let's find this out in Python, right? So old houses, uh, houses in Old Town by all houses into houses in Old Town minus one by all houses minus one, right? Because you have already picked out one house from Old Town. So that probability comes out to be bad. That is almost, uh, yeah, that is 0.5%, right? 0.5% is a probability that your first house is also from old town and the second house is also from old town right so that that's the understanding that you need to kind of develop here uh, now let's let's do this through a class activity now which is you toss a fair cause three times right let's assume the three events to be independent so what is the probability of each of those three heads right so h h h right so if you coin if you toss your coin three times right If you toss your coins three times, so three times means that the first time it could be H, the next time it could be H, it could be H as well, it could be H, T, H, it could be H, T, T, it could be H, T, H, 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 T, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so there are possible, total possible eight outcomes, right? So out of these eight outcomes, uh what are the what is the probability that it would be three heads right so obviously the three heads is one of this one out of this eight possible outcomes so one by eight now you can also calculate the same thing by h h h now each of the turns the probability of h coming out is half the half here as well half here as well right so you can basically multiply half three times over and you would come out to the same conclusion right 
let me write down all the possible outcomes for you so there are if you roll if you basically flip a coin three times over there are eight possible outcomes right as i've mentioned hhh hdh hdt hht thh tth tht ttt right so out of them if you are just looking at hhh that's one of the eight possible outcomes so the probability of hhh is one by eight. now obviously also you can basically concur you could have inferred the same thing also because these three events are independent right whether in the first coin it was head does not basically uh is or the second chance it was head does not depend on whether it was head in the first time or not right so because these events are independent you can basically multiply the probabilities of each of these events and you would come to 1 by 2 to the power 8 right now what is the probability that you observe exactly one head right so now so that's perfectly fine so now what is the probability that you would basically observe one head right so one head is basically uh, all of these events right exactly one head is basically out of this possible option so exactly one head is this this and this so there are three possible outcomes where we basically see exactly one head right so the answer would be our ideally three by eight that you can verify just from the examples here right so this this and this these are three possible outcomes so that you can clearly measure by 1 by 8, 1 by 8. You can have basically calculated uh, the probability. So this is intersection of these three events. The intersection of this three event is summation of these three events because they are mutually exclusive. And each of the events you can calculate their probability. This is half, half, half. Again, half, half, half and half, 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 right? So this probability of HTT is half into half into half, right? And similarly, THT is half into half into half and TTH is half into half into half. So that's why you come up with 3 by 8. So given that you have observed at least one head, what is the probability that you can observe uh, at least two heads, right? So now let's A1 be the event that we observed at least one head, right? At least one head is basically there are seven possible options. There's this one possible option, TTT, which we do not want. But at least one head is basically all this option. Now let A2 be the event where we observed at least two heads at least two heads there are four possible options then we basically can write p of a is 7 by 8 and p of b is 4 by 8 and p of b intersection a right so p of b intersection a is basically the common events between both b and a now this is basically all the four events are part also part of a so p of b intersection a is 4 and p of a is so p of b intersection a is 4 because these four events are also part of a right so p of b intersection a is also probability of b so P of B intersection A by probability of A and then you can calculate this out to be 4 by 7, right? So out of 7 possible options, uh, given that there's, it's already said that there are, it's at least 1 and that means there are 7 possible options. And out of that, what is the probability that given this has happened, what is the probability that you would observe at least 2 heads, which is basically this thing, right? So out of these 7 options, there are only 4 favorable outcomes. So 4 out of 7 is what is the probability of a given b right so we understand this concept as well log on to gray atoms learning platform to unlock more free content subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon for regular updates